Hello and welcome to the North Carolina State University Small Ruminant Educational Unit. I'm Dr. Andrew Weaver, the Extension Small Ruminant Specialist here at NC State and the faculty liaison with the Small Ruminant Educational Unit. I'm here today with Nicolette Wolf. Nicolette, would you like to introduce yourself and tell uh, the folks about your role here at the unit? I'm Nicolette Wolf. I am the manager here at the Small Ruminant Unit. Um, I manage the daily um, management of all the animals and all the employees. Um, I've been here since 2019, September, so almost two years now. Um, I went to Iowa State University uh, for animal science and did a lot of small ruminant dairy work uh, in California and Wisconsin. Um, so now I'm happy to be here managing the work. So it's been a great asset to have Nicolette here at the unit and she's done some great things in the, her first year or two uh, here as the manager and, and we look forward to, to, to what's going to come on down the road. So uh, our, the mission of the unit here, the reason we have the unit here on campus is really to serve those three pillars of the land grant mission and those would be teaching, research, and extension. So first off, this is a teaching unit. Uh, this is a, a unit, uh, an educational farm where, where we bring our classes, we bring our undergraduate as well as our Ag Institute uh, students out to the farm uh, and allow them to learn about small ruminant production, sheep and goat production. And so it's an opportunity for many of these students, they, they don't necessarily come from a farming background. And so very few of them actually have small ruminant experience coming into college. And so for those students, this is an opportunity for them to get that hands-on, one-on-one uh, experience with sheep and goats and learn all the basics of management, either land and kidding management, nutrition, genetics, selection, uh, as well as some pasture and forage management as well. So it's a great opportunity for these students to learn and get some hands-on experience as part of their education. Secondly, uh, we're, we're an extension uh, opportunity for producers around the state. We provide extension education programs uh, utilizing the unit and the animals at the unit. We also do applied research um, and, and address and, and, and answer some of those questions that producers and, and uh, industry members have uh, in North Carolina as well as around the state. So that extension component and the research component are, are in a way intertwined uh, in that many of our extension programs and, and those educational programs we're doing for producers are, are complemented by applied research programs uh, addressing those questions and concerns uh, that those folks have out in the industry. We do some basic research here. Uh, there are some faculty members utilizing uh, some of these animals for more basic research, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but that's a brief summary uh, of why the unit's here. Um, you know, research, teaching, and extension is what we, we do here at the unit, um, and I think it's a great opportunity for NC State, North Carolina, and the entire Southeast region. Uh, behind us, we have our replacement group. Um, it's consistent of our spring-born uh, replacement Catan use and also our far, fall-born replacement Dors cold Dorset use. Um, they have a livestock garden dog with them. Um, we're now grazing them uh, throughout the summer and hopefully as far in the fall as we can. They get moved every couple days to keep the worm, worm load low. Um, these girls will actually be exposed to ram and hopefully bred later this summer, early fall. So NC State is actually the birthplace of the Pole Dorset. The Pole Dorset breed was developed here in the 1950s um, and Dr. Lim Goode uh, was the, the faculty liaison at the time. He was the individual um, who started that, the development, that initial development of the Pole Dorset breed. So we have some cool history uh, with the Dorset specifically here at NC State, um, and we hope to continue that legacy on by raising, uh, continuing to raise those pulled Dorset sheep. Our pulled Dorsets, um, they, we have a group that lamb in the fall, uh, our fall lambing flock, as well as the spring lambing flock. So we're utilizing, um, you know, lambing both times a year and, and marketing opportunities that comes with that, um, and trying to increase those out of season uh, lambing genetics um, and, and improve upon those. We also are enrolled with the National Sheep Improvement Program with both our Dorsets as well as our Cantatas. So we are collecting uh, performance records. We collect uh, weaning weights, post weaning weights, carcass ultrasound data, as well as fecal light count to measure uh, and, uh, and analyze our, our parasite resistance within our flock. 
we take that data and we, we submit that to NSIP and generate estimated breeding values or EBVs for those various traits. So we utilize those genetic tools in our selection program to improve the performance of our animals, the fitness of our animals in a, a parasite-rich environment, and also the, the carcass acceptability, the carcass quality of the animals that we're producing. So we're utilizing those genetic tools as a selection measure, um, one of those tools in the toolbox uh, to help improve our flocks. So like I said, we have our, our NSIP dorsets as well as Katahdins. Our Katahdins, uh, as many of you are aware, the Katahdin breed is prevalent across the Southeast US. And in terms of the commercial sheep industry, uh, it is uh, largely represented by Katahdins nowadays. And so to, to meet, like I said, those extension and research needs of the industry, uh, we have uh, continued and developed and are growing our Katahdin flock and, and doing more work with those hair sheep. Uh, those hair sheep in general tend to be a little bit more resistant to those inter internal parasites. Obviously they don't require shearing, so a little bit lower maintenance. And uh, we, can, we can manage that flock uh, in, a, in a very productive, um, efficient way. So uh, we're managing those Katahdins. Uh, those Katahdins, we put a lot of selection emphasis on those maternal traits, um, on the number of lambs born, number of lambs weaned, prolificacy, milk production, as well as parasite resistance. Our goal is to generate uh, a youth that is, that is low maintenance, that's easy care, that's parasite resistant, and will thrive in our, our largely fescue-based, parasite-rich, um, hot and humid climate here in North Carolina. So those are the two primary breeds that we have here at the unit in terms of sheep. Uh, we do run some goats as well, um, some boar cross goats um, that we're, we're working with as well um, to meet those educational needs and, and extension needs as well. Um, we do run some black faced sheep and we're gonna to go up to the facility where we, we manage those sheep uh, here next. Uh, behind me, you see our sheep confinement housing. Um, right here we have our black face group housed. Uh, they're a combination of camp and Suffolk ewes. Um, they're very high, or they're very parasite uh, susceptible, so therefore we combine, combine them and keep them off grass. So as a result of keeping them off grass and keeping them on parasites out of their body, we're actually increasing our pregnancy rates and our lambing rates. So these black face used cows in this facility are utilized primarily for research. Uh, there's specific faculty members uh, within the Department of Animal Science that are utilizing these sheep, and we are raising these sheep, we're managing these sheep to meet those specific needs. So that's the primary purpose of this flock here that you see behind me. Uh, they are utilized for research, their lambs will go uh, towards research efforts. Our Dorset and Katahdin flocks, those are purebred flocks. Those are flocks that, that we are trying to raise purebred animals most elite animals within those flocks we are marketing as purebred seed stock uh, through through purebred sales through production sales through our wolf pack roundup sale as well as uh, the NSIP sales and so those animals as one most elite genetically elite animals are being sold as breeding stock and then we're marketing the rest of those animals through local sale barns our farm primarily focuses on meat production we are producing meat type animals we raise primarily medium wool type sheep and because of the lack of value in uh, the, the fleeces produced from those medium wool sheep, most of our wool we either do not even market it um, or it may be marketed through some regional wool pools, but for the most part we focus more on the meat side of production. So because this is a confinement facility, there's some additional considerations that we need to take into account uh, when managing these animals and primarily that is ventilation. Ventilation is extremely important and probably the most important aspect of designing a housing facility. So it's really important to consider that ventilation and, and here in this facility, because these animals are in confinement full time, uh, we have to make sure we have enough airflow, air turnover, uh, that we minimize any sort of respiratory disease incidents within this flock. So we utilize fans across this back wall here. We have two uh, small high powered fans uh, located on each side of the barn here. So we have a total of four of those smaller fans, as well as two of these larger fans uh, that are oriented here in the alleyway. The idea is to pull air in from the corners of the barn, get that air circulating towards the middle of the barn, and then utilize these large floor fans in the middle of the barn to push that air out the end of the barn and get that airflow coming through the entire facility. So not, not only do we want air movement, but we also want air turnover. 
So that's why we're trying to get as much air pushed out of the barn and bring new air into the barn as possible to keep the air as fresh um, and, and healthy as possible inside this, this, this confinement facility for these animals. So we're working, we got our, our fan system set up and it seems to be working quite well. We just moved into this facility uh, in January, so relatively new and this is our first summer here. Um, seems to be working very well and, and we have some good air turnover, good air movement uh, within this facility, so we're pretty happy with, with our ventilation system. In terms of our feeding system, again, because it's a confinement system, we are providing all aspects of nutrition for those animals. There's no opportunity to graze. So we're utilizing these single-sided feeders that you see here. Uh, we feed these animals twice a day. Uh, these feeders have a graded system here, uh, some hog panel that allows the, the concentrate feeds to fall through and go into the, the feeding pan here at the bottom where they can eat that. And then we can put hay in the top of the feeders and that hog panel can hold that hay back and, and minimize the amount of waste that's being produced and allow those use to eat um, out of those feeders. In general, we, we allocate about 20 inches per mature ewe and her lambs. So when we're at the peak of production, when we have those ewes as well as their lambs in this facility, we're figuring about 20 inches of bunk space, of linear bunk space per ewe. And so it's really important to make sure you have enough bunk space that all of those ewes can get in and eat. Uh, we wanna make sure that even maybe some of our smaller ewes uh, are used that, that aren't quite as dominant, still have the opportunity to come in uh, and get that, that feed twice a day. So bunk space is very important, uh, as well as our water. Our water is fed off of a, uh, a frost-free hydrant that we have that's cooked, connected into uh, um, a float valve that manages an automatic type water system that's available for these animals. So the big things with this confinement housing system, the ventilation, proper feed, uh, feeding systems and feed utilization, as well as making sure there's an adequate water source. I'm inside our pen now in our confinement system. Um, below my feet, you can see some straw. Another big thing uh, in the confinement system is getting them a comfortable bedding pack um, underneath their feet. So we bed at least once a week in here and sometimes more often during lambing. And you'll see this bedded pack kind of grow, and then we'll clean out a uh, minimum twice a year. Um, and then included on this bedded pack, we will also lamb on top, which is a very nice service to lamb on, very warm and secure and safe for the lambs. So including in the confinement system, behind me is a example jug that we actually use for the use after they lamb. So they will lamb out on the bedded pack as a group, and as we do our lamb checks throughout the day and throughout the night, we'll bring uh, you and your lambs into our jug so that they can bond. Um, in here we'll have food and water, um, concentrate, hay, um, and then it, of course we always keep the bedding crush. So then we can create this jug and we can build the jugs next to the beginning jug. Um, I think we have eight, we can build up to eight, we can build. So we can have eight ewes in a jug at a time. And then when we're done, when they're done bonding and we think they're healthy, we will actually just let them out of the jug and they're back into their original pen. In terms of shearing here at the unit, uh, we shear twice a year. So I know that's not ideal in terms of generating a long staple length and necessarily a, a marketable fleece. Uh, but for us, we're more concerned about the health of those animals especially here in a confinement system, as well as with our dorsets. Uh, we're trying to run a, a semi-accelerated system and try to get those sheep to, to lamb as often as we can. And to do that with the hot summers that we have, uh, we, we are shearing twice a year. So we're shearing approximately every six months. We generally shear about a month prior to lambing because we want to lamb out those sheep with as little fleece on them as possible. Shearing used prior to lambing improves your birth weights of your lambs. It improves the survival of the lambs. Uh, it improves uh, the, the air quality and the moisture in the barn. It actually reduces moisture within the barn during lambing. And it improves the quality of the fleece if you are marketing that fleece by shearing prior to lambing. So we consider that a, a very important management uh, aspect. And so we make sure we always shear about a month to 45 days prior to, to lambing. So that's going to take place generally in November and December. And then we're going to shear again, generally around May or, or the first part of June, uh, early summer. Uh, to get those ewes uh, shorn down, ready for the hot summer, and improve our breeding success there later on in the summer. Again, like I mentioned, we're not 
we're not really focused on necessarily marketing the wool. We are concerned more so on making sure that animals stay healthy and productive. And so we try to keep that fleece length as short as possible. Behind me are some mature ewes. Uh, they're actually our katahdins. Uh, but as far as mature ewe management, all of our dorset and our katahdin ewes are out on pasture um, until a brief period when they come into lamb, into the barn. And then they're sent back out to pasture with their lambs, which they will graze until we wean. We'll bring them in to wean, and then the ewes and lambs are separated, and they are managed back onto pasture, with, also along with their lambs are managed on pasture.